Hi, Marissa. Hi. I'm Kelly. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. I think it's a little bit later where you are, isn't it? Yeah, it's 8 o'clock. That's why it's kind of dark. It's also storming really bad here, so I'm happy oh, really? like, I have power. It's storming really bad. Well, let's, let's be grateful while we have it, huh? <laughs> well, we do have a generator, so we shouldn't be totally knocked out, but it might blip. But just... uh, Okay, yeah. fingers crossed. Well, thanks for joining us. I know it's a little bit later in the day. Um, it's, it's one of the later ones we've done, so we'll see. It looks like a lot of folks are tuning in, so that's great. Maybe it works, works great for that. This is my and your kiddos are going to bed, and on our side, it's when kind of, uh, I call it, the witching hour starts. <laughs> That's why I do it this late because my kids are like they're at least in bed. One's asleep and one's in bed right. um, because otherwise they just be like running and screaming and I can't concentrate. So yeah, I'm heading to the witching hour on, on this coast. <laughs> so it's all good. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I appreciate it. And, and I'm excited to uh, talk to you about pediatric physical therapy. And I'd like to start with how you got involved, um, how you found your way and this became your path. So maybe if you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. So I have um, one of those just non-typical journeys. Like you talk to a lot of physical therapists or people in any field, really. And they're like, oh, I knew as soon as I went to college, this is what I was going to do. I went to college for biology and I lived in New York at the time. And that's really what I thought I was going to do. Um, and it quickly became a reality that that is an impossible field to get into. Um, I joined the military. I moved to Florida. And while I was down there, I got my master's still on that environmental science train. And it wasn't until I was about 30 and I had moved here to South Carolina that I realized that my true passion was always to help people and to work in healthcare, but I just didn't know where my niche was going to be. Um, and then, so I kind of did, you have to do shadowing hours. So I, I inquired in all the different programs. And when I did my shadowing hours for physical therapy, it was when I shadowed in a pediatric clinic that I was like, this is it. It was something, the first patient that I walked in and it was actually a very, um, like a more severe patient. So it wasn't somebody that we were just working on developmental skills. It was somebody, a, a patient that was very disabled, but just watching the therapist with him and just seeing how he came in and how he left. It was just my, I knew from that moment. So once I got into PT school, I pretty much just found all the pediatrics people. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And so set my path. And I went to, you don't have to do for physical therapy. You do not have to do residency, but I went straight <laughs> residency right from graduate gra right after I graduated PT school. Um, and I've just been working in pediatrics ever since. So I'm heading into my seventh year of practice and I've done pretty much every setting. I've done a little bit of schools, but that's the least. The other Marissa that helps me run this account, she does all schools. Um, and then I've done outpatient, I've done inpatient acute care, which is another passion of mine. And I have a very small business. And when I say small, I mean me, providing early intervention services uh, here in South Carolina. Oh, wow. That's great. And, and were you online providing your physical therapy during COVID? Was it on Zoom? With so, your is, yeah, I did eight months of teletherapy and I'm on. So I'm very involved in like local government as well as some of our national programs. So American Physical Therapy Association is our big umbrella physical therapy. Mm -hmm. um, like they're just like our national association. And then there's a pediatric section under that. So I'm involved with that, but I'm also involved with the South Carolina state stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I actually fought to have teletherapy happen because we had a lot of therapists that were displaced. I mean, people were like, if we can't bill insurance, we, we can't pay you. Um, so it wasn't an ideal situation. I'm happy that we were able to provide services to patients during that time because what it did was it showed all the insurance companies that we can do this. Like we can still get really good results. And for in pediatrics, especially, it's very difficult because I mean, you're having to educate the parents. Normally they're used to me coming and being very hands-on. And here I am like baby doll being like, okay, this is what we're going to work on. And so um, it was just a new style of practice. And I had to, I think all of us really had to dive really deep into ourselves, get creative, look yeah. for, I was very pregnant at the time. So having to like sit and do it as opposed to move around was very hard. Um, but it was really rewarding because I saw so many families make so much progress that I don't know that they would have made otherwise, you know, like the parents themselves besides yeah. the progress. So it was pretty amazing. I really, I, I, I'm glad that it worked out the way it did. We were one of the families who did uh, tele PT uh, during COVID. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's true. I think, you know, normally we would take our, our child to a PT therapist mm -hmm. or the home, but when the parents um, or caregivers are forced to learn, you know, they, it, it's, I think it was, it was really beneficial because even after the 30 minute session, 
you do it throughout the day because you know what you're trying to work on and you know, you know, even silly games that you play, you try to make it part of the exercise and it's really. Um, it builds confidence too for parents. Yeah. A lot of parents, that's the complaint. They're like, I just, I don't feel like I have the handling skills that you have. So I was just trying to figure out any way to show what I'm doing with my hands and kind of give that off to you guys. So it was, I'm glad we did it. I would still yeah. use it in the event of like, God forbid. So I live in South, so obviously we have bad storms. Mm -hmm. um, so I've told um, companies that I've worked with like, oh, if, you know, if we've got power, but it's not safe to be on the road, I'll do a teletherapy session. If we've got a kid that's maybe one of the other kids in the household is sick, but the my patient is not sick, we'll do teletherapy. Um, and it also gives us the, the reach. Like South Carolina is very rural. Some areas we, can, we physically can't get out to them. Um, so it helped in those aspects. But I definitely think most families, that was one of the reasons I started my business is because my families were like, we need you to come back. And yeah. the company I worked for previously, they were but, still, they yeah. were still, and so I just, well, yeah. Well, I'm glad. Thank you for doing it because, you know, it, yes, it, it added another responsibility to the parents who are already wearing so many hats during COVID. Um, but we were, we were also just itching for them to come into the home and they were still like, sorry, we aren't doing it yet. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, come on, please. Back. I mean, I still even now use a lot of precautions, even though I'm vaccinated and whatever. Um, my son has asthma and I work with a lot of medically compromised and yeah. I don't want to take the chance. So I'm like, I'll just keep using all the safety protocols and that way we make sure that everyone can still get services and it's been working out. So I'm happy. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Cause yeah, it was, it was a lot during COVID. <laughs> it, was. <laughs> it was a lot for a lot everyone. Of, of tip school, they're trying to pay, the parents are working from home. They've got kids home from daycare and then they've got the child with disabilities that yeah. or just developmental needs and they're yep. trying to, so it was a lot, and I'm really glad that we're not there anymore. Trust me. We, we are too. <laughs> it was a lot. All right. So I, I was trying to think about, you know, there are lots of folks tuning in, so I, I appreciate that. And just to let everyone know who's joined us, if you have specific questions that you'd like to ask Marissa, please feel free to, to um, type your questions in, and, and we'll be happy to answer them. But I'm, I'm just trying to think in general. Um, as a parent, um, you know, I think about, okay, I, I, I worry more about what I, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Don't know what I don't know. And that's kind of the thing. So I guess the overarching question that I was trying to think of, how could we uh, bring, uh, you know, as much good and beneficial information to those tuning in as possible is if possible, like when to worry, right? Okay. When to worry is an overarching question. It talks about milestones, basically. The thing that I'm so glad that you brought that up because I don't know I, – as a pediatric therapist, the CDC kind of blew up our world a couple months ago when they changed all the milestones. And so that's been a hot button topic that has been all over just everything, social media. And then it's been, I've seen it on the news and uh, obviously I've seen it with our professional associations. Sure. I'm not as, as a therapist, I'm not super happy about the way it worked out because I feel like it backed up a lot of the milestones, but a mm -hmm. lot of what I tell parents and what I tell them is even if it's your first child, I don't ever want you to like compare your child to another, like you'd be like, oh, my friend's child is two months older, but they're not doing the same or we're not doing the things that they were doing at that age. I don't want you to get caught in that rabbit hole, but I also want you to trust your intuition. So if you feel like something is off, something might very well be off mm -hmm. and you are better contacting somebody. So in every single state, there's an early program from zero to three. So from birth to three years old, the program is completely free and you can self-refer. So if you have to just Google early intervention services here in South Carolina, it's baby net. Every state is different. So I can't just say go to this website. Otherwise I gladly would, but I just had a parent contact me the other day about some concerns. And I always just say, just go into that site and refer because you're better off having somebody come and look at your child and tell you, no, you're fine. Mm -hmm. than to pediatrician and the pediatrician to say, no, let's just keep waiting. Let's just keep waiting. The CDC says that that milestone isn't even a milestone. Let's not worry about it. But you feel that nagging sensation like in your heart. That is a real thing. I mean, I have two small children and even before I was a therapist, it's just like you just something just doesn't feel right. 
Um, and so I offer free consults. So if parents contact me and I'm like, I'll just come take a look, you know, no charge to you. And if I feel that the child qualifies for services, then we'll get rolling from there. I'll request the prescription. I'll do all the legwork. Um, but that's kind of when, if you self refer to a baby net, even if your child doesn't qualify, that's probably a really good sign. It means that they're not showing, um, developmental, like any kind of holes. Um, but I will tell you like for my son, cause we went through this process, he did not qualify, but I knew that he needed speech therapy. It still showed a delay, but it was only in his actual expressive, like his words, but his receptive was so high and that's why we didn't qualify. But she still gave me the scores and we could see how low it was. And I took that to mean we definitely still need speech therapy. And I just went ahead and got him a referral and I went from there. So even if you get refer, like you get, and they're like, oh, you don't qualify, but you're looking at the norms and your child is below the norms. Just contact us, some, just go to your pediatrician at that point and be like, I need a prescription for either PT, OT, speech, whatever it is um, from there. And so that's usually what I say. Now, if you are looking at a milestone chart or you're following any of the other, because there's some great PT content that's available on social media. For us, we mostly deal with um, trying to get new grads on their feet. Like when they work in pediatrics, they have no mentorship, but I follow a lot of great and I would have no problem giving out some of that information. And they give more realistic, like if you aren't seeing this milestone by this date, and we usually go by a two month rule. So if your child isn't showing any readiness signs within two months after when the milestone should have started. So for instance, I'll give you an example. Your child should be rolling between four to six months. That could be back to belly or belly to back. If you aren't seeing any attempt to roll either way and you're getting close to that six month mark, then we want, to, we want you to be seen for an evaluation because there's probably something there. We never call babies lazy, never, ever. I hate that when I hate when I, when I hear a therapist say that, I go, oh, when I hear a pediatrician say it too, I go a little crazy because um, there's always a reason that your child's not moving. So it could be that they had a little bit of a growth restriction in utero. So maybe like their neck was positioned funny. So it's caused this whole tightness down one whole side of their body. Babies are smart. If it hurts, they're just not going to move that way. And so if it's restricting them and then we've got some uh, reflexes. So like when you see the baby do like that little fencing pose, that is so that they can actually see their hand and then they want to move towards their reaching for things. Well, if they can't turn their head a certain way, that's going to impact their ability to roll that way as well. So um, those are kind of my general guidelines for those sorts of things. So if you definitely have some sort of gut feeling, it's better to go see somebody and to be like, your child is perfectly like where they should be. And they'll give you, if it's a good per a good clinician, they'll say, these are the kinds of things I want you to start working on that are just easy, just developmental, normal play. And those skills will naturally just develop. And if they don't, they'll say, call me back in two months. And gotcha. then we'll at that point. So it's a two month rule. Um, two months. You aren't seeing some sort of readiness sign within two months of when that skill should be achieved. Then we want to see in clinic or referral for is there a um kind of a and is that based on the cdc milestone so it's two month rule that, from the based on like developmental like the kind of training that we get in school and it's because if you so really what it is is if you're so if you're two months past when it should have emerged and it hasn't even emerged yet it could be a month or two before you start receiving services. So now in effect, you're like four months behind. So the reason we say two months is because it kind of gives us almost like a head start because we want to get started as early as possible because that's the whole purpose of early intervention to start as close to birth as possible so that by three or five, when your child starts school, they're as caught up as they can be. Right. Understood. Okay. Gotcha. Well, that's good. So the rolling is four to six months. And then outside of that, um, there are some reliable sources that you like, um, yeah. in terms of the other milestones when that window is? Um, yeah, so let's talk. I'll go kind of in developmental sequence. And so um, we want to see by – I'm trying to go as far back as possible because, like, babies from zero to three aren't doing a whole heck of a lot. But definitely by that two to three month, we want them yeah. to – tolerating some tummy time and at least being able to lift their head and kind of turn it to either side and hold it up for a few seconds. Um, and then tr from there, we kind of want to see them pushing up on their arms. So it shouldn't just be where they're barely clearing their, their face from the floor. It should be like where their chest is starting to come up. Okay. Um, comes in about four to six months, the, um, sitting. So sitting is really broad because you can start when I say prop sitting, I mean, sitting with your hands kind of in front, supporting your weight. That can start as early as five months. And then 
between that six to eight months is when we're starting to see development of independent sitting. So when we can start lifting our hands off the surface and we've got toys in our hands and we're not just falling over. Um, it's typically not till closer to seven to eight months before they can really, like you can put them down in sitting and they don't just like fall over within a few seconds. So even if it's closer to eight months, that's a-okay. Especially if they're rolling and doing other things, that's less of a concern. Okay. Um, Crawling typically comes in anywhere from like eight to 11 months. That's also a pretty broad one because the earlier children start, a lot of times, like my son was one of these kids. He just wanted to move so bad. He was just dragging himself across the floor at like six or seven months, but it looked just horrendous. And it wasn't until closer to eight or nine months that he was actually hands and knees crawling. And it's because he didn't have the core strength because he just was literally dragging himself um and we can talk I'll, i know there's a question about like crawling we can talk about how to actually promote crawling on hands and knees um but that's why there's a wide range some kids don't do anything they work on rolling and they work on all the other developmental milestones and then literally at eight months boom they pop up on hands and knees and they just take off my daughter was like that um but if they start earlier they may start on that kind of dragging crawl for that army crawl for a while and then they don't pop up um Usually once crawling comes in, so around that nine to 10 months, you'll see pulling to stand, cruising along furniture. That again could be like nine to 11, just kind of depending on when the crawling comes in. Um, and then walking is also a really broad one. So I think people start to panic when their kids aren't walking by 12 months, but the range really is like 12 to 16 months. And that's why like by 14, 16 months, if your kid isn't even like really cr like cruising well or cruising between surfaces where they can reach off like, so if you've got an ottoman and a couch and they can't like only have one hand holding on and then reach to the other surface, that's when I'm like, okay, I'd like to come see your child because there might be something else that's holding them back from walking. Um, and those are pretty much the major ones from there. Then they really start spacing out. You know, we talk about higher level skills, like being able to walk up and down the stairs, kicking a ball, um, running is a big one that I think parents get really nervous about, but toddler runs are really goofy for a really long time. Um, and then Jump Jumping is, is another major one that comes in um, right around two. So jumping either off, straight up from the floor or from a low surface, um, that's usually right around two. So my daughter is 20, she'll be 21 months on Friday, and she's just like getting into it. Like she can sometimes get one, like both feet off the floor, but most of the time it looks like a gallop. So like one foot and then the other. Sure. Um, and that's pretty typical too, because they have to get enough strength in that they got to get low in the squat. They've got to have enough propulsion to get up on their toes and then the force to actually get off the floor. So that's why all these other things happen in sequence. So we get enough strength and enough balance and enough core strength because you've got to really be able to hold your body up over your legs, especially if your legs are moving. So it's just like a controlled fall. And if you don't have that, you're literally just going to fall. So what, what would you say the um, age range is for stairs, kicking a ball and running? Um, stairs so we like to see kids be so crawling up the stairs typically around mm -hmm. 12 months coming down the stairs that is and i'm saying backwards like a backwards slide um mm -hmm. on your tummy that's closer to 16 to 18 months um and that's just because like depth perception and safety going backwards a lot of times when i'm working on going up the stairs with kids crawling at, at 12 or 13 months i tell parents i'm like don't even try to practice going backwards yet we really need to get good at going up um, and then walking, so therapists, we call it step two, like step together. So one foot, then the other comes to the same step. That's closer to two. And they still will be probably holding on with one hand for a little bit. And then probably by two and a half, they should be able to be mastered walking up and down. Not, not saying that you should as a parent let them, but they should be able to walk up and down the stairs without holding on. Um, step together. By three is when you kind of start seeing that like step over step. So one foot going up. Um, and then it's much closer to four or five. They can master going up and down the way adults would go up and down. So not holding on one foot on each step. That really is kid dependent where it's, it's much closer to four to five. Um, kicking a ball can be as early as 18 months. Um, it might not look super great. It might just be like their foot is just kind of dragging on the floor. Um, but an actual like picking a foot up and really clearing it to kick, that's closer to two. Um, a lot of times for my kids that aren't interested in kicking a ball, but we need to work on that, I will take an old can of some sort, a formula can or like an old oats can, um, put some beans in it and glue it shut so they don't swallow those. Um, and then it gets that auditory feedback. So they, they hear the rattle and they want to rattle it. But if you put it on the floor and you kick it, it's going to rattle when they kick it. 
Um, so I do that a lot with kids that are like just not interested in a ball and that's okay. Um, same thing with like two year olds can catch. I call it a playground size ball is like that red ball that we play kickball, like back in elementary school. Yeah. That's a playground size ball that our standardized testing uses. So they should be able to like pull it into their body and catch it like that. Um, it's much closer to like three before they can catch it away from their body. And then we start getting kind of smaller with the ball from there. Um, but I think those were all the ones kicking stairs. Yeah. Ball. Uh, and then running, running. Um, so it depends on when they start walking. So running can cut, like usually within six months. And then a lot of times it's just like a faster waddle. Cause just yeah. like toddlers learn to walk. It's like a toddle. Like they just kind of go side to side because they're getting their balance and they're learning and they have to also develop single leg stands. They have to develop that nice heel to toe pattern, which that also doesn't come in a true adult walking pattern doesn't start until about three, but you will see a, like if a, some a baby started walking around, let's say 12 to 14 months, probably by 18 months to two, you'll see something that looks a little bit, you know, their, their base is much more narrow. They're not so wide. Their hands aren't up as high and they're just, it looks like they're just kind of walking. Um, so usually within six months, you'll see like the run, um, but you will hear it like, because they're little chubby little feet, which I love so much. They're not really clearing the floor and getting what, so adult runners, we call that double float. There is a period where your feet, neither foot is really on the ground for true adult <laughs> running. Um, I don't think toddlers ever get that. So you hear their feet kind of smack on the floor um, and that's normal too. And then again, it won't be until a little bit later into toddlerhood where you actually see them like swinging their arms and you get a little bit of that trunk rotation. That is what, when we're looking at that, we're usually looking at like an elementary school age child that is like really struggling with running because they laid lack core strength. Um, but for toddlers running, it, it just looks goofy for a really long time. So we just want them like running. We're okay with that. Gotcha. So the, the cross arm action is that an indication if it's not happening that there's a problem or is it an indication that they just are a goofy toddler still? Um, it depends on what age they are. So if you're looking at a two-year-old, I would not be concerned about that. If you're looking at like a five or a six-year-old, I probably would be concerned. And it, it usually goes with other stuff. So either it's a coordination issue, it could be a strength issue. And the strength is typically in their core because what they're doing is they're locking that part of their body. So like I just, when I just did that, I mm -hmm. like to run and I squeezed my arms really close to my body. And so I didn't have to work as hard because I just like <laughs> half my body um so typically we'll see that we'll see some sort of compensation pattern um so even my kids that are really really low tone so you have muscle tone that's what keeps us upright and mm -hmm. so um, this one of the therapists she describes it like a rubber band so like when you get a brand new rubber band out of the box it's like super duper tight and you have to work really really hard to like stretch it to use it the way you want to use it that's a higher tone now, once you've been using it for like a week, it's perfect. Like you can swirl it around your hair three times. It's like the perfect size. It fits on your wrist now. That's like a normal muscle tone. And there's a big range of that. Um, and when it's, you know, now you've had it for a couple of months and it's super duper stretched out. And now you've got to wrap it around your hair like eight times to get the kind of ponytail you want. That's a lower muscle tone. So the, the hairband always works. It's just, is it working too hard? Does it have to work a little bit harder to do the job that it needs to do? So for my kids that are lower tone, a lot of times they are the ones that are trying to run, but they're having to like stabilize their whole body because they're working so hard against gravity to begin with. And that extra gravity, not that there's the forces are any different. It just feels heavier to them because their tone is so low. Um, it's just, they have to do something to keep themselves from just falling. Right. Face. And right. we'll see that. like my low tone kiddos, the parents will tell me after like, they're trying to keep up with their friends. Um, they're with their siblings and their cousins on the farm. And just after two hours, they're just like, they're just done. Like they yeah. literally not do it. And I'm like, they are working like 50% hard. So like those kids are at a hundred, your kids at 150 and they've been going for two hours. Like that's it. I'm happy about that. I know that as a parent, you're like, but I want them to be able to keep up. But I'm like, but two months ago, they couldn't even keep up at all. Like they were just sitting in your lap. So sure. those kinds of things like the, the, the little inch stones that I'll measure against to show that, that there's been progress, but also on the other side of that, you could just see how much harder that child is working. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. Uh, well, I appreciate that because I think that will be helpful for a lot of parents wherever they are in the, in the milestone stages to have that kind of indication of, of yeah, and, I, I, zone, and then two months outside of that. Cool. I, stones are because a lot of the kids that I work with, um, can be a little bit more severely disabled. And so I'm like, I don't want you to get so like, cause sometimes it's just, we, 
there are some milestones we don't meet and that's okay because it doesn't, it's not indicative that we're not going to make progress. It's just either going to be slower or it's going to be. And when I say that, it's just because certain times, like you could be walking, working on rolling forever, but you're not going to be working on rolling with a six year old. Like it's just not right. practical. We yeah. need to get that right. And we need to get them away sitting and then a way to do some sort of assisted walking. And so um, sometimes we have to work through stuff like that because it is hard as a parent. I, I totally understand. Now that I'm a parent, I totally understand that. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, you know, I, I keep reminding myself of popcorn, you know, it's all the kernels are in the oil and they pop at different times. So we have to remind ourselves of that. <laughs> I mean, some kids, they come to me and the parents have already been told by the whoever, like, cause usually there's a large team and they say, oh, well, your child's never going to X, Y, Z, insert milestone here. They're never going to walk. They're never going to talk. And we blow those milestones out of the water and we just tell them your, your child is an individual. And I yeah. just kid, like, I see your super cool kid who I want to be even cooler. And one day is going to like, just change something about this world because that's why we were given this whatever this is, you know, like it was just meant to change everybody that's involved. And so that's just the, it's more of a long-term focus. Um, but I do, I mean, a lot of my families, we go through multiple stages of grief, just depending on the child and, and what we're dealing with. And that's okay too. I mean, yeah. it's just I think another important thing is, you know, for the fear factor to change the fear to feeling that knowledge is power and empowering parents, you know, yeah. as opposed to, kind of putting it on the back burner or just um, ignoring it, ignoring that feeling that you say, trust your gut, trust your instinct. Cause I think it's some, and, and if, if parents don't know um, that's okay too, you know, but eventually they know when they know. Right. But, um, but just really trusting that more knowledge is power and the faster you can get your child's services, um, the better, because it really benefits them and not just in physical therapy, but in any type of therapy that's, that's needed. Uh, and, and taking away a stigma because, you know, they all, they are all on their own, their own, uh, you know, journey. And it just takes a little longer and need a little extra tools in their toolbox, similar to, you know, us as parents, you know, tools in our toolbox. That's what we're trying to collect. Bodies are amazing things um, and they're capable of a lot, but sometimes we need extra tools. And, and that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing when we actually align and can find those tools and deliver them to our, our families. So, Yeah. No, we've, we've definitely been on that journey. <laughs> so it's, it's you know of, I didn't know until I knew. And then I knew and it's like, okay, we're on this. <laughs> and long time. And I still get um, families with diagnoses that I've never heard of. So it's like, I didn't know that either. And I'm learning and I'm diving into the research because I'm trying to, just like you said, I need to get educated so that I can educate them. Because a lot of times the parents, just depending on where they are in their journey, sometimes they know way more than me, which is great because you can tell me exactly what your child needs. But if you don't, I need to make sure that that family has the resources and we're getting all of the services we need. So whether it be orthopedic, neurological, do we need to see cardio, do we need to see GI, I need to make sure that we're covering all of our bases um, so that way that child gets all the services and can be as successful as humanly possible because that's really all I care about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, I, I think that's actually really, really helpful um, for trying to cover as many folks as we can who are tuning in. But I can tell that you have a wealth of knowledge here. And I'm, I'm you know, really impressed and super excited uh, that we're able to introduce. I also learned that when we both talk at the same time, the other can't be heard. So I was just, I was doing a lot of smiling and nodding as opposed to what I would probably normally do. <laughs> because I didn't want to, I didn't want to mute you. Um, but I, I, I think it's awesome. And you, you did mention that um, part of your work is trying to get new uh, physical therapists kind of on the path, um, seeing kids. And, and, and so there's one question that we received. Um, it's a little bit more technical than I understand. So I'm just going to read it. It says, what PEDS CEU courses do you recommend for a new PTA in Florida wanting to work in PEDS PT? So that is so broad. There's literally no way for me to that. But what I can say is um, there's a couple of different ways you can go about that. And so there is very, so I just want to say there's limited CEUs for pediatrics to begin with. Um, and so a lot of times what I will recommend is to go to our pediatric section. So like I said, there's the APTA, that's the American Physical Therapy Association, that's the umbrella. Then there is the um, the pediatric section that's below that. So it's the Academy of Pediatric Physical Therapy. They throw a big conference every year. Um, this year, it's always in November. 
This year it is in, oh my goodness, it just totally, hold on, let me look it up because I don't want to lie to you. Um, but <laughs> it, the, all of the programming is pediatrics. So you, and you pretty much get all of your CEUs like in one weekend. Um, and so that's what I think is, I'm all about like bang for your buck. The other thing you can do is for your state, you can look at your state association and see what they offer because they'll have all their like, so for Florida, you would just like go to the Florida board's website and you can Google all of the different CEUs that they're, and usually you can sort them. So you'll be able to sort by pediatrics um, because otherwise it, oh, and then there's the PTA, there's the, for PTAs, there's like the advanced practice stuff too. And so there's like advanced practice for pediatrics. And so there's, there is some stuff there. Let me pull up the, the Academy website because that way I'll have that um, for them because that is amazing that they want to do that. All right. So the first thing was looking to see where the conference was this year. So, and I, I just worked with one of my residents too about getting them ready for it. So you would think that I would remember exactly. <laughs> I'm like, it's on the West Coast somewhere because they jump coasts every year. So that way they make sure to, to keep everybody. Oh, it's in Portland this year, Portland, Oregon, for anyone that's interested. Um, and so it is November just 17th and 18th. Um, so you get a good weekend there. And then so advanced practice. So the advanced practice for PTAs is kind of like doing residency. Like it's just like a lot of coursework all at once. Um, and so I just Googled it and it took me to the PTA advanced proficiency pathways. And there's one for each specialty. So acute care, cardio, geriatrics, neurology, oncology, orthopedics, pediatrics, and wound management. Um, and that's like a 10 year thing. And so basically like if you're a part of the APTA and you're licensed PTA, doesn't matter what state, um, it enrolls. You have to submit your stuff by August 31st. Okay. It's an online portal. I can, um, I can send that. it to you. I just went to like APTA. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's the PTA advanced proficiency pathway. So that person was interested in pediatrics, but obviously if anyone happens to be tuning in and they're like, wait, but I want to do this other, it's all the specialties across the board. Um, cool. And that's, that's not just going to be CEUs. That's going to be like advanced stuff. So you'll get your, so CEUs are continuing education credits for PT. You have to have 30 hours every two years. I'm not sure what it is for PTAs. Um, and then, so basically like we're in an even year, it's 2022. So we'll have to renew at the end of the year and you have to have all 30 of your credits. And so, but this, because it's education, it's continuing education. Um, it would be that as well. Great. Well, it's, it's awesome that we have someone who tuned in who's on the path. That's really cool. Helping out the kiddos. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time so much, Marissa, and, and I think we probably need to do a follow-up because um, we just kind of I know. skim, skim the, the very surface, right? Um, but I think there's a lot that you can, uh, you know, teach all of us as parents um, and give us more tools for our toolbox um, as we, you know, wing it with our kiddos. Uh, we're doing the best we can, and sometimes we just need – it's great to have, you know, the experts of their field and the ones who are super passionate who can share some of these little tidbits that we can – you know, help, help us along our parenting journey. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and especially so late. <laughs> um, so thank you. And we will, we will probably meet again. All right. Sounds good. And then if anyone has questions, I mean, it's at pediatric physical therapy, please just shoot me a DM. Um, especially if you have a specific question about something I discussed, I did have all my toys over here cause I wasn't sure how deep we were going to get into it. But, um, if you want to do follow up yeah. questions, I think we'll have to go, we'll, we'll do another session. We try to do like 30 minute snippets for for parenting schedules, but I, I think uh, we'll connect and then figure out what you think would be a next um, good, good kind of secondary, and and maybe we'll even start a little thing, because I think there's a lot of a lot of great information here. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Take care.